The formation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or dual monarchy, begins with yet another 1848 revolution. The Hungarian Revolution. The people of Hungary were unhappy, and wished for more say in the Austrian Empire. Austria's policy here, initially, was one of aggression, and so the Hungarians attempted to fight fire with fire. Hungary declared its independence in 1849, however still wished to be ruled by the Austrian Habsburg monarchy, sort of like what Scotland is to England today. Not exactly, but in a sense. Austria would not allow this, and so called in the Russian Empire to help them end the rebellion. Hungary soon fell back under Austrian rule. This was followed by the 1859 Second Italian War of Independence, where, backed by the French, Piedmont Sardinia pushed back Austria and secured the region of Lombardy. War led to a financial collapse, and the absolute monarch, Franz Joseph I of the House of Habsburg, lost the confidence put in him. A constitutional monarchy had been formed to restore the bank's faith in the nation again, hence weakening the power of the monarchy. To make up for lost land, Austria looked north to the German states. The Austro-Prussian War of 1866, the war to settle which of the two Germanic monarchs would become the main influencer over the German states began. Prussia, allied with Italy and many other minor German states, won the war after just six weeks of fighting. The war was getting hot, and there was threat from Russia and France against Prussia, that this small European war could have sparked into a global conflict. Bismarck pushed the Kaiser, Wilhelm I, towards negotiating a quick peace. Prussia was able to form the North German Confederation, and Italy gained Venetia from the Austrians. The defeats were humiliating. In total, their side lost 132,000 men, as opposed to the Prussian side, losing less than 40,000. The situation in Austria was dire. It seemed they would lose their great power status, and collapse internally to revolts. The Hungarians saw their Austrian overlords as being at their weakest, combined with the fact that Austria had no chance of Russian support this time round, after betraying them and opting out of the Crimean War of 1853. Franz Joseph decided in 1867 to compromise with the Hungarian part of the empire to ensure their loyalty to the Habsburgs. The two were independent nations, different governance, tax rates and laws, yet acted as one nation state two constitutional monarchies headed by one emperor. This, in theory, could have been very unstable, as one simple disagreement between both states could have led to an all-out collapse, yet it held together. The Empire, after realising Italy and Germany were not the fronts to be fighting on, pushed south instead into the Balkans, occupying Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1878, and then annexing the region in 1908, creating the Austro-Hungarian Empire we all know and love. There are three points, however, that I wish to stress. 1. It needs to be understood that the two states were separate and independent. They shared things such as a currency, yet were separated in other areas, such as passports. An Austrian passport and a Hungarian passport existed. Nobody could be a citizen of both states. There was also a third passport that must be discussed, the Kingdom of Croatia Slavonia, which was an autonomous region under the Hungarian crown. 2. This may be more of a fault of the education system, but Austria-Hungary was nowhere near the puppet of the German Empire that many are taught it to be. For the most part, they acted alone and independently. However, due to their outdated military, as the Great War progressed, they would gradually fall into depending upon German support. The empire was growing economically as well, reaching the early stages of industrialization. And three, 
its memory is not one, necessarily, of hate. Historians have found that many people, who once pushed for independence for their people post-war, regretted it and developed a nostalgia to the old Habsburg regime. Reason being, according to sources at the time, the people got along despite their differences. Although they were not free, at least it was stable, Hungarian writer Mihaly Babitz stated, we are independent, but instead of feeling joy, we can only tremble. Although I am certainly not arguing everyone felt this way, just simply pointing out that there were many benefits to the empire that are often overlooked. Finally, what is interesting is how public Archduke Franz Ferdinand heir to the throne was about his intention to reorganise the empire. The Archduke wished to bring Hungary back under Austria, believing it would strengthen the Habsburg monarchy and will secure the loyalty of other cultures in the empire. Many other regional cultures looked at Hungary's extra rights with jealousy. However, in return, the Archduke wished to create a Catholic Yugoslavia to unite the Slavics in the empire instead. However, the Serbians wished to unite the Balkan Slavs into one nation, and so claimed a lot of surrounding areas. But this would be an orthodox state. The Archduke's plan, one could argue, could have been to use this nation to be able to claim more of the Balkans and have the excuse of unification to open up a war with Serbia, or at the very least, to play down Serbia's claim. This plan he had however abandoned by early 1914, instead wishing to create a United States of Austria, where each culture has a more equal say, although none of this came to be as he died. Welcome to my new series on the history of diplomacy of the First World War. It will give a detailed look at many alliances, agreements and international developments that took place during this time period. Some stuff I won't go over, such as the treaties of the Crimean War or the Franco-Prussian War, both of which could be argued as major catalysts for the Great War. They somewhat fit into this, but personally, I would prefer to cover them way more in depth in some future series. So, look out for that. Anyway, hope you enjoyed, hope you learnt something. Subscribe to get notified of the next episode, but for now, this has been the history of diplomacy.